All right, so I wanted to make a video, or perhaps a couple, of, a couple of videos, we'll see, discussing the axiom of choice, because this is a topic which is really central um, to a lot of mathematics, or even if it's not central, it's a really um, interesting topic. And it's also a topic that doesn't need a whole lot of background information um, in order to get your hands on it. All you really need is, um, like an understanding of um, like um, elements and sets and propositional logic, universal quantifiers. Basically, if you've taken a course in like uh, maybe a linear algebra course that was done from a pure mathematics perspective, or if you've taken an intro to proofs course, or even if you've taken some sort of course in symbolic logic or um, something like that, then you should have most of the tools that you need to understand this. And even if you don't, you can maybe try to follow along and see um, how much of it you're able to grasp. Um, but yeah, there's not a lot of prerequisites and this is really interesting. And it takes some work, but you can sort of get the idea of this. Um, so just to start out with, let's just state the axiom of choice. It says that if we have a collection of non a non-empty collection of non-empty sets, then if you take the direct product of these sets, then that direct product is non-empty. Um, and so if you think about that, it sort of seems like it should be obviously true. At least that's how I think of this. Um, is that, okay, well, if you've got a whole bunch of non-empty sets and you line them all up next to each other and sort of um, put them together through a direct product like this, then obviously what you get should be non-empty. Um, but the issue is you think about this and you th uh, the big question is, okay, so if it's not empty, then it has to have an element. So how do you prove that there exists an element? Um, and you could think, oh, well, I'll go about constructing one. So what I'll do is like, I'll take Let's see here, so we have a bunch of X alphas. So let's say that, um, let's say that there's like a countable collection of this. Um, let's say we've got like X1, X2, X3, blah, blah, blah. Then um, we could just, well, X1 is not empty, so we can choose an element from that. And X2 is not empty, so we can choose an element from that. And X3 is not empty, so you can choose an element of that. And th those will give you, like the element you choose from X1 will give you the um, one coordinate element. The element you choose from X2 will give you the coordinate two element and so on and so forth. And so, so forth. And so you can get all of the, um, you can determine what the value in each coordinate is. And that should give you an element. Um, but this process, of course, like this only works if this set A is countable. Um, okay, so I guess you need to understand what countable sets is to understand this. Um, but anyways, so yeah, so A needs to be countable. So um, what if A is uncountable? Then you, you sh could imagine that you should be able to do the same thing, but it's not entirely clear how you would go about doing that. Um, so to determine whether the axiom of choice is sort of a true or a false statement, we need some background in something that seems completely different. And this is orderings. So let's go through this. Um, a partial order, um, there we go. A partial ordering on a non-empty set X is a relation R on X, which with the following properties. So um, if x is related to y and y is related to z, then x is related to z. So this is like a transitive property. Um, if x is related to r and y is related, to, if x is related to y and y is related to x, then x and y are the same thing. And then x is related to x for all x. Um, and so the idea here, they, they, they mention it later on, but um, we typically think of this as less than or equal. So this is sort of like a generalized version of the less than or equal to operation. So uh, if you replace these capital R's with less than or equal to signs, then obviously um, it will 
status that then all of these will hold for how the less than or equal to operation works on say the real numbers okay so if we look at this so this is a relation r on x um, and so this just gives you a whole bunch of relations this doesn't guarantee that any two elements of x are related like you could have an an element x and y in this set x and maybe neither one of these is less than or equal to the other and that's completely fine um, but if this relation also satisfies that for every two elements of x then they're related to each other in some way so either x is related to y or y is related to x then we say that r is a total ordering i'm not going to call it a linear ordering because total ordering makes so much sense the total set is ordered um whereas linear i don't know that doesn't make as much sense to me personally um, for example, if E is any set, then the power set of E, so this is a collection of all subsets of E, is partially ordered by inclusion. Um, so just to talk through that quickly, like if A is a subset of B and B is a subset of C, then A is going to be a subset of C, that makes sense. If A and B are subsets of each other, then they must be the same set, and of course any set is a subset of itself. Okay, and R is, is totally ordered by its usual ordering less than or equal to. So then taking this, as, this last example, we will usually denote partial orderings using less than or equal to. Um, you can write strictly less than, but we don't really use that. Um, we observe that a partial ordering on a set X will naturally induce a partial ordering on every non-empty subset of X. Um, by the way, I should have mentioned, this is coming from Fallen's textbook on real analysis. Highly recommended textbook. It's pretty standard after um, taking a first real analysis course like um, Principles of Mathematical Analysis by Walter Rudin, something like that. Um, but yeah, great textbook. This is like a preliminary stuff that comes at the very beginning of the textbook, and I'm just going through it because um, it does a pretty good job but it leaves a lot of details out and I sort of want to fill in those details um, just so that you can see this. So a partial ordering induces a partial ordering on every non-empty subset um, because you just, um, for the subset, you just, all the relations still hold, but only for the elements in that subset. Okay, order isomorphic, we don't really care about that. Okay, if X is partially ordered, that a maximal or minimal element of X is an element X in your set such that the only element Y in the set which is greater than or equal to X is X itself. That's what it means to be a maximal element. To be a minimal element means that the only elements Y and X which are less than or equal to X are X itself. So um, coming over here to my notes um, okay, go away, please. Thank you. Um, X is a maximal element of the set X if for every Y in X, if X is less than or equal to Y, then X is equal to Y. And then X is a minimal element if for every Y in X, if Y is less than or equal to X, then X equals Y. So it's the same thing but flipped. Then we have this other definition. Okay, so maximal and let's see, your maximal and minimal elements may or may not exist, and they need not be unique unless the ordering is total. Um, and I believe I talk about that a little bit. Um, let's go through this definition first. If we have a subset E of X, then an upper or lower bound for the set is an element x such that y is going to be less than or equal to x for every element y and e. So an upper bound for e, um, I think I wrote this again here, I don't know if I wrote it, wrote it any differently. Um, given e and x, x is an upper bound for e if for every y and e, y is less than or equal to x. Or x is a lower bound for e if for every y and e, x is less than or equal to y. So 
the difference, one of the differences here is that um, an upper bound for the set E does not need to be included in X. The, or, uh, sorry, an upper bound for the set E does not need to be included in E. Um, all right. Um, so these definitions, they look pretty similar, but they are slightly different. Um, let's just do a quick example. If we take the real numbers and take this interval, open interval from zero to one, one is an upper bound for E, but it, one is not an element of E. So certainly one is going to be greater than or equal to every number, which is strictly between zero and one, but one is itself not a number, which is strictly between zero and one. So it is an upper bound, but it can, it's an upper bound for E, but it cannot be a maximal element of E. Um, all right, so what else do we have here? So an upper bound for E does not need to be an element of E, I meant said that, and unless E is totally ordered, a maximal element of E need not be an upper bound for E. And Fallen says that you should think of some examples. Um, I'll think of some for you. Um, and I'll sort of prove this. So um, let's see, I don't know how much longer my computer is going to be able to handle things. All right, um, but let's just go through this. So we have a claim. So where where is my highlighter? Highlighter, come back. Where did you go? Okay, so let E be a subset of X. If E is totally ordered, then any maximal element of E is an upper bound for E. Okay, so let's prove that first. Um, so let E be totally ordered. We know that it, X is in E because it is a maximal element. And since it's a maximal element, we know that for every y in E, if x is less than or equal to y, then x equals y. We want to prove that x is an upper bound for E, so let y be an element of E, and we want to prove that y is less than or equal to x. Since E is totally ordered, either y is less than or equal to x, or x is less than or equal to y. One of these must be true, because for E to be totally ordered, that means that um, all any two elements are related, and x and y are both elements in E, so they must be related in some way. So, um, certainly, so what we want to prove is that y is less than or equal to x. Um, so if that's true, then um, we're done. But if x is less than or equal to y, then x must equal y, and that's by um, the definition of a maximal element. Um, which is mentioned above. Okay, so x equals y, and if x equals y, then x and y are less than or equal to each other, and so this tells us y is less than or equal to x. And so it is guaranteed that y is less than or equal to x, and hence x is an upper bound for e. All right, um, so that's the first statement, and this, the, the second one is that if e is not totally ordered, then this not, need not hold. So it does not need to be the case that a maximal element of E is also an upper bound. And so basically, if we look at the, the proof that um, a maximal element is an upper bound, um, what we did is we used this step here that since E is totally ordered, either Y is less than or equal to X or X is less than or equal to Y. So if we want this um, maximal element to not imply upper bound, then we have to have two things which are sort of not related. So for the second claim, let's take our set E to be to consist of two elements x and y and some other set x or f. Where so z and z is less than or equal to both x and y for every element in for every element z and f, but x and y have no relation. So x and y are greater than or equal to every element of f, but they're not related to each other. So I claim that x is a maximal element of e. 
And so to prove that, suppose you take any element z in e. Well, certainly x is in e, so that's satisfied. And take any other element, z in e, and suppose that x is less than or equal to z. What we need to prove is we need to prove that x equals z in this case. So note that z cannot be y because x and y have no relation. So, it, so the fact that x is less than or equal to z means that x and z have a relation, which means that z can't be y. All right, so this tells us that z is either an f or it is x. So either it's x or it's some element in f. And if z is an f, then z is less than or equal to x. And this again implies that z is equal to x. Um, and, be, and this is because... Um, So yeah, so we're, we're supposing that x is less than or equal to z, and if z is an f, then z is less than or equal to x, and you combine those two and you get equality. So if z is less than or equal to x, then it's guaranteed, no, if x is less than or equal to z, then it is guaranteed that z equals x. And thus, x is a maximal element. Of course, you could similarly prove that y is a maximal element of e, but... Um, that's not useful for this proof. So we have x is a maximal element. However, x is not an upper bound for e because we have an element y in e which does not satisfy y is less than or equal to x because y and x are not related. And I think that is the end of this proof. Great, it's not responding. Yeah, that's the end of this proof. Okay, so we've worked through that example where... Um, Yeah, we, we've worked through these examples where an upper bound for E need not be an element of E, and unless E is linearly ordered, a maximal element of E need not be an upper bound for E. Um, I want to see if there's anything else I want to talk about. Maximal and minimal elements may or may not exist. Um, for maximum and minimal elements not existing, let's take the real numbers ordered by less than or equal to. There is no maximal element. Every real number has a larger number. Um, and maximal elements need not be unique unless the ordering is linear. Um, so again, for maximal elements needing not be unique, if the ordering is not total, then the example that I just talked about works, because like I said in the proof, um, we proved that x is a maximal element for f, but it also, no, x is, x is a maximal element for E, but you could buy the same argument, but with x and y flipped, you could prove that y is a maximal element for E. So in this case, this set E has two distinct maximal elements. Okay, so because my laptop is starting to bug out a little bit, I'm going to sort of cut this here and then talk some more about well orderings.